So on this, this is our 5.3 notes. The title got cut off. But on the next page, you can see it says notes 5.3, page 2. So hopefully you can deduce that this is page 1 of 5.3. Um, what 5.3 is all about is this little thing called graphing cubics. Now, from day one of the school year, you learned what a cubic was. Do you remember what it was? Okay. Degree of three. So this is graphing polynomials that have a degree of three. All right. We're going to learn about some specific things with regards to um, cubics. They have certain characteristics that we're going to be graphing. Um, also, we're going to be looking at this thing right here which should look pretty darn similar to something that you worked with last week. There's just some slight differences. Um, this should remind you of, let's see if I can get to it easily, this thing. Yeah? Okay, what's different? Kind of ignore this B part. Because, again, we're not really going to talk about B, and it, you can treat it just like the other one. But what else is different other than the B? It's in the degree of, it's in the degree of three. There is that guy right there. There's a cubed. And there's something missing. The uh, F function. The F. Okay. We use the F when we don't know what kind of function we're dealing with. Or if it's not necessarily even a polynomial, it's maybe just some random shape that we're moving. We just use the F thing, okay? When we know it's a cubic, we take the F out and we put a cubic in. That way we know it's a cubic. Um, so let's talk about things that we did yesterday or last week. What does A represent? It represents a vertical what? Three things. Reflection. Stretch, compression, right? It's a vertical reflection when A is negative. In other words, A is less than zero. It's a vertical stretch when A is greater than one. And it's a vertical compression when A is between zero and one such as one-half, three-fourths, etc. This should be review for you, right? Just reiterating stuff we learned last week. What was B? Y Oops, why am I writing B? B, why am I writing B? You're throwing me off here. Horizontal, and it's actually a horizontal reflection stretch or, stretch or compression. But we only focused on horizontal reflection, and that happened when B was less than zero. Correct? Okay. What about K? What is K? It is a vertical shift. Now, shifting does not change dimensions at all. It merely changes location. The A value is what would change your dimensions. When we have a vertical shift, we go up when K is greater than zero, and we go down when K is less than zero. So if it's positive, you go up. Negative, you go down. And finally, H. What's H? H. Horizontal shift. And when H is, or let's say we go left when H is less than zero, and we go right when H is greater than zero. Now, H is the tricky one. I'll put a little star next to it because what do you have to do with H? You have to change the sign of what it was in the equation to identify what it is. Okay. So-so. All right. 
Now, for cubics specifically, we are going to talk domain and range, and we're also going to learn about this new thing called end behavior. And end behavior kind of looks like a foreign language right there, but you're going to become very fluent with that foreign language. All right? One thing that I love about cubics that at least gets you two points on the test every single time is the fact that both the domain and the range for cubics is all real numbers. So I'm going to shorten how we're going to write the domain and range for all real numbers so we don't have to do the infinity thing every time. And we're just going to do our fancy R. Do you remember how to do a fancy R for all real numbers? Mm -hmm. You do two lines down like that, and then you make it into an R. It is not the letter I and then the letter R. It's kind of like in English, they do the paragraph symbol, but it has two lines for the P. So our domain and our range are both all real numbers. So we're just going to use that abbreviation because we're going to be writing it a lot. It's just easier to do. Capiche? Good answer. All right. End behavior, I think it's a little bit confusing to write it here. So I'm going to go down to the graph and we'll write it on the graph. All right. Um, let's see. Should come point. Graph should include two points on side of on each side of I. In other words, you're going to have five points total when you graph it. I want to see five points graphed. Okay. Now it says on the side of I, and I didn't touch on I up here. Shame on Franken. Right here. This is one of the most important things for cubics. Now. I also didn't talk about mother functions. Shoot. Oh, bring it's going all backwards. Mother functions, M-U-T-H-A. The book calls them parent functions. I call them mother functions. Get parent, mother. It goes. Um, you remember things when I say weird things like that. Now, a cubic has a fancy point called an inflection point. You know, a parabola has a vertex. That's kind of the most important point. A cubic has an inflection point. Now, the mother function of any graph is the one that has no transformations on it of any kind. So it has no H or K, and A and B are not doing anything to it. It's the original, the OG. Okay? Um, once you start adding A to it, or B to it, or H to it, or K to it, then you have some kind of a transformation of that mother function. You have offspring. Get it? So, in the mother function, your inflection point is always 0, 0. The reason is because the actual definition of the inflection point is always going to be H, comma, K. And in the mother function, what's H? 0. And what's K? 0. So that's why the inflection point of the parent function or the mother function is 0, 0. I'm going to say that as many times as I can because it makes you pay attention. <laughs> You're trying to see if I'm going to slip up and say the other one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm experienced, I promise. All right, so let's start off by graphing the mother function. Here's the mother function. <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay, so do you notice there's no A, B, H, or K? Yeah. So this is just your original <laughs> cubic function. And what did I say at the top was the inflection point of the cubic function that's the mother function? <coughs> zero, zero. Reason is because the inflection point is always going to be HK, and in this one, H is zero and K is zero. Capiche? Now, the inflection point is the most important thing to identify first because when you make an XY table... Unfortunately, there's no shortcut like rise over run for cubics. But you have your inflection point. That is always going to be the middle of your XY chart. So you have to have that inflection point to start off. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, think about this for a minute. I want to know what's going on around 0, 0. So I need to come up with some other x values that are around 0, 0. So the best way to do that is just to pick what would be the two numbers to the left and right of 0, 1 and negative 1. And then the next one's out would be 
to a negative 2. So in other words, I should have five numbers consecutive in a row with that inflection point being the middle one. Question? Uh, so why is the negative like on the top and on the bottom? It doesn't matter. You could put the negatives on the bottom, positives on the top. Um, I probably, yeah, I don't know. Yes? Um, yes, it matters because, huh, the real answer is no, but if you use any random numbers, you're going to get a bunch of gra points that are not going to fit on your graph. We have set up the dimensions of the graphs to fit the inflection point and the two that are just to the left and to the right. Yes. Yes. So, no, it doesn't matter. You could graph it using any points you wanted to technically, but this is how you're going to actually be able to see what you need to see on the graph that we've provided you. All right? So, um, let's see. Now, if I'm on the test or the quiz and I don't know what the heck I'm doing, I'm going to at least get two points for what? For domain, and range. domain and range. Because I'm going to see them and I'm going to go, oh, easy points. Right? Even if you can't do anything else, you can put your domain and range. Now, now that I've filled in my x values, what do you think I do to get the y values? Plug them in. Negative 2 to the third power is what? Negative 1 to the third? 1 to the third? 2 to the third? And now let's go graph it. So negative 2, negative 8, negative 1, negative 1. 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 8. And this is what the mother function of all cubics looks like. This should be a little curve there. It's not curving as nicely as I would like to, but I'm not an artist, so. So, five points graphed. You see one, two, three, four... Five points are graphed. All right. Before I talk about the end behavior, I'm actually going to go do the next one just so that we can compare it, okay? Um, I think that'll be easier. Now, this next one has a little bit of different stuff going on. What is my H value in this one? Look in your parentheses. I see a negative 2 right there, which means H is... Positive 2. Yes? What is my K value? There's nothing outside, so K is 0. So uh, what I know is from the mother function, this has been shifted 2 to the right. Yes? It also has an A value of negative 1. So what else is going on with it? It has a vertical reflection going on. So it has taken the mother function, vertically reflected it, and shifted it two to the right. Okay? Do I need to figure out how to flip this and shift it? No, I can just go straight to my XY table. How do I find my inflection point? It is HK. So it's going to be 2, 0. Where does that go? In the middle of my XY chart. So what numbers should I use around 2? One, 0, 3, and 4. And again, you could have it flipped upside down. That's fine as long as you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 on your XY chart. Capiche? How do I start plugging it in? <sighs> I'm going to use my calculator because I'm lazy like that. All right, negative 1, parentheses, 0 minus 2 to the third. Now, if you carefully plug it in the first time, I'm going to show you how to use your calculator to your advantage. When I cube it, I get 8. Now, I'm not going to clear anything. I'm just going to arrow back. And where the 0 was that I plugged in, I'm going to change it to a 1. And now I get 1. And now I'm going to arrow back. And where the 1 was, I'm going to change it to a 3. So I don't have to retype it in every time. And then I'm going to arrow back to the 4, and I get negative 8. Save yourself some time. Yeah? yeah? Mm -hmm. Sure. 
the Casio one does that too. All right, so let's plug these, or let's plot these. 0, 8, 1, 1, 2, 0, 3, negative 1. Now, cubics are always going to have those three points that are kind of grouped together in the middle. That's the inflection point. And then 4, negative 8. So, do you see the shift right to? The inflection point is no longer at 0, 0. It's been shifted over to 2, 0. Do you see the vertical reflection? How can you tell it's been vertically reflected? From the graph, how can you tell? Just from the picture. It's flipped. What do you notice when you look at what's flipped? Like, what part of the graph tells you it's flipped? Are you looking at the inflection point to tell whether it's flipped or not? What are you looking at? The ends. That's where end behavior comes in. All right? So here's what's going to happen. Let me translate this statement into English for you. You ready? This statement means as X approaches... Infinity, comma. In other words, as x gets really, really, really big, what side of the graph is x getting really big on? The right side. It would be the right. That's where positive infinity is, right? So we're talking about the right side of my graph, which happens to be right there. <coughs> where is y going? Is it going up or is it going down? Yeah. <coughs> on the right side of my graph, y is going uh. up. So y is also approaching infinity. y is going towards the sky. When it says as x approaches negative infinity, what part of the graph is that on? That would be the left side, so the arrow that's on the left of my graph. Where is it going? Is it going towards positive infinity or is it going down towards negative infinity? Negative infinity. You're going to get sick of me asking about end behavior because we're going to do it for every stinking thing. <coughs> so this one, I forgot my easy points on this one. Domain and range. I know, I'm going to fail. All right, as X approaches infinity, is that asking about the left side or the right side? Right side, because X, infinity, that's the right side of the graph. It's going down, so where is H of X, or in other words, Y, going? It's going down, so that means I fill it in with negative infinity. Every single time you do end behavior, your only options are positive infinity or negative infinity. That's all you're filling in. And then this one says what's going on on the left side. Where's it going? Towards positive infinity. Now, with cubics, you're always going to have one end going to negative infinity and one end going to positive infinity. You just have to figure out which one. With parabolas, <coughs> is that the same case? No. No, they would either be both sides be going to positive infinity or both sides going to negative infinity. All right? And we're also going to look later at cortex, quintics, six degree, seven degree. It, you, could, you could answer that information for any polynomial once you figure out the pattern. Yes, question. Why are the infinities switched? Because of that vertical reflection. This one, if we were to travel from left to right on this, it's almost like we're ending up going uphill, right? So the right side's going up, the left side's going down. This one, if I travel from left to right, I'm going downhill. So the right side's going down, it's the left side that's going up. So it's that vertical reflection that made those two flip. Okay? All right, let's look at this guy. What do I start off with? Hint, hint. Inflection point. So what is my H value here? Zero. There's no parentheses, is there? That makes H zero. What's K? One. So my inflection point is zero, one. So I actually have a vertical shift, don't I? My inflection point, one, two, three, four. Why'd she give us extra lines here? 
Is that throwing anyone else off? Yes. Yeah. Zero, one. Oh, I see why she gave us extra lines. Because what do we have in this one? It's your, what, third favorite F word? A fraction? Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Right behind Franken and factoring, right? Sure. Franken, factor, fraction. Yeah. Um, so when we have a fraction, we don't, if we can avoid plotting fractions on our graph, let's avoid it. Okay? Because fractions aren't very fun. Um, so let's think about this for a minute. If I chose 1 as my next number, 1 to the third power is what? 1 times 1 half is 0.5. I don't want to deal with decimals. Let's change this to 2. 2 to the third is 8 times 1 half is plus 1 is 5. Let's skip the 1 and go to 2 so we're not plotting decimals. Capiche? Which means on the negative side, negative 1 is going to have the same issue, isn't it? So let's do negative 2. So let's see, what's negative 2 to the third? Negative 2 to the third is negative 8 times 1 half plus 1, negative 3. Okay, so since I skipped a 2, what should I do next? Should I do 3? 3 to the third is 27. Not going to cut in half. 4 is probably my next one. 4 to the third is 64 times 1 half plus 1 is 33. And negative 4 would be negative 64, negative 32 plus 1, negative 31. I'm pretty sure. Now those are big numbers, aren't they? They're going to be off my graph. But that's okay. I'm going to graph what fits on my grid. Okay? So let's see. 4, 33 isn't going to work. 2, 5, 0, 1, negative 2, negative 3. Now, let me tell you something for a minute. Somebody asked, why do I have the negatives on top? I switched it around for this one and had the positives on top here. The reason why I do the negative ones on top is because when I have the positives on top, I'm literally graphing from left to right. I'm sorry, from right to left. And I prefer to graph from left to right on my x-axis. That's why I tend to do it the other way. Didn't know until I flipped it, but that would be why. Okay, so these three points, these middle three ones are the only ones that fit, right? Now, let's think about this for a minute. I did mention that there's going to be these three that are fairly close in the middle, and then there's going to be these two points that are kind of out there. Yeah? These are the three regularly, or the three in the middle that are fairly close. But I have to keep in mind that by the time the graph is crossing x equals 4, it has to cross at 33. So I can't just continue out like that because it's not going to cross at 433, is it? It's going to start curving up pretty steep there. Same thing over here. It's going to have to start curving down pretty steep there because it's negative 4, negative 31 before it's going to cross there. So this is kind of an exaggerated. But let me show you on my graphing calculator to make sure we're on the right track here. Let me graph it for you really quick. Uh, uh, X to the third. What in the world just happened? Go. Now my window is all kind of funky, but if I go zoom, let's do standard. It does kind of match mine. It's a little bit flatter there because of what they've got, right? But if I made the window match mine, what does mine go from? X minimum is negative 4, X max is positive 4, Y minimum is negative 8. I'm sorry, I want that to be 1. Y minimum is negative 8, Y max is 8. So that's the same window as mine, just the dimensions obviously are off. 2 is where it's going to kind of flatten out. 
okay? I'm sorry, not two, one. So that's what my graph looks like. What's my domain and range? Get those easy points. And now let's talk end behavior. X arrow infinity. What side of the graph is that talking about? Left or right? Right, right side. What's going on? It's going up, so I put positive infinity. X arrow negative infinity is talking about the left side. And what's going on? Down, so I put negative infinity. Easy peasy. Okay, you try the next one. Come up with your inflection point and go from there. Okay, so what's my H value? Zero. Nothing's in the parentheses after the X. What's my K value? Negative one. So my inflection point is zero, negative one. What are my easy points? <coughs> domain and range. By the way, why are the domain and range both all real numbers? Because if I were to think about domain, those arrows mean it technically is going to continue going out and it's going to continue going up and down as well. All right, zero, negative one goes in the middle, right? Yeah. Okay, I need X values around. No fractions, so I don't have to worry about what I did over here. So I can just do negative 1 and negative 2 and positive 1 and positive 2, yes? Here's where it gets a little tricky. Negative 2. If I'm plugging in negative 2 right here, can this negative sign count as that negative sign? No. So I technically have a negative negative 2 to the third power. <laughs> to the third power, minus one, and I get seven. And I'm going to arrow back so I don't have to retype anything. I'm going to change that two to a one. So I'm doing negative one, and I get zero. Now I actually do have to go change things because it's not negative, negative one again. It's going to just be negative one right? And I get negative 2. And then when I plug in 2, oop, too far, too far, I get negative 9. So let's plot our points. Negative 2, 7, negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1, 1, negative 2, and 2, negative 9. Can you fill out the end behavior? Yes. X arrow infinity. What side of the graph is that talking about? Right, right. right side. It's going down. down, so I put negative infinity. X arrow negative infinity, that's talking about the left side. It's going up, so I put positive infinity. Now, why do I read that every time? Because sometimes I'm not going to guarantee that it's always written the positive side of X first and then the negative side of X. So you do need to know what it's meaning because sometimes they might ask about negative side of X before they ask about the positive side. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think we try and remain consistent, but there may be sometimes you come across it that it's backwards. Okay? All right, back side. So back side is a little different. I'm going to give you F of X and G of X, and you're going to write the equation. So, in other words... What have we got? A cubic function has been graphed. Describe the transformation of the parent function. Okay, so the mother function is right here. On each graph, the mother function is right here. How do I know that's the mother function? Here's how I know it's the mother function. It goes through the point 0, 0, 1, 1, and negative 1, negative 1. That's my mother function. 
zero, zero, one, one, negative one, negative one. This one looks a little bit different, but that's because it's counting by 0 0.5. So zero, zero, one, one, negative one, negative one. Okay? So, so? Easiest thing to pick out first, H and K. Because you find it from where your new inflection point is. Remember, there's those three points in the middle that are close together? The very middle point is your inflection point. What are the coordinates of that point? 4, 2. So H is 4, K is 2. All right. Now, this is the part where things get a little funky. You ready? I am going to draw a box from my inflection point to the point directly to the right of it. In other words, if I drew a rectangle right there from the inflection point to the point next to it, that rectangle is two units high and one unit wide, correct? What is it on the parent function? It is right there. It is one unit high and one unit wide. So do you see that dimensions have changed? Which dimension, the vertical dimension or the horizontal dimension? Horizontal was one, still one. Vertical was one, now it's two. So the vertical dimension has changed. What letter affects a vertical dimension change? A. A. K changes a vertical location, but not a dimension. Okay? So I have an A value. Because my horizontal stuff is all the same, I don't have a B value. I just have an A value. Um, and that A value, if it went from 1 to 2, it has doubled. That makes A2. So far, so good? Last thing I need to check, is the end behavior of g of x the same or opposite of f of x? Same. same. Right side's going up on both of them, left side's going down on both of them, so I have no reflections of any kind. If they were opposite, I would throw a negative sign onto that a. Get it? So now we just put it all together. So g of x is equal to a parentheses. Notice I did not put an f. Why didn't I put an f? Because this is a cubic. I know what kind of function it is. I have to put x. I'm going to put the h in parentheses with it, but if h is positive 4, what's it going to look like here? Negative 4. Don't forget my to the third, because that's my compromise for not writing the f. I need to put the third. And then what do I do? Plus, k, sorry, plus 2. K is 2. Not too bad? Okay, let's try the next one. All right, H and K, easiest ones to start off with. What is the new inflection point? Negative 6, negative 5? Yeah? Negative 6, negative 5. Now, this one messes with you a little bit because they um, only give you two points, not three points in the middle. Do you see that? <coughs> But this is the inflection point because this is where it kind of flattens out a little bit. This is where your other point would be. All right. Um, let's see. A value. Because we're not going to talk so much about B values. But let's look at that rectangle. If I make the rectangle from the inflection point to the point to the right, I have a 1 by 1 square. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the same as in the parent function? Mm -hmm. Yes. So A is just equal to 1. However... What do you notice about end behavior? It's opposite, right? That means it has to be negative 1. Negative because end behavior is opposite. So let's put it into our equation. G of x is equal to negative. I don't really need to write the 1. And then if h is negative 6, it's going to look like plus 6. 
Don't forget the cubed, and I'm emphasizing that because inevitably someone's going to. Then I put the minus 5, and that's my equation. Okay. All right, you try the last one. Write the equation of it. <laughs> Write the equation of the last one. Start off with H and K. That's the easiest place to start. This one's kind of mean. Yeah. <laughs> Why do I say this one's mean? Well, let's look at it. Uh, where's my new vertex? Right there. What's that point? Zero comma negative four. Right? 0 0 0.51, 1.52, 2.53, 3.54. So H is zero, K is negative four. Now let's make our box. Now the box looks different here because it's counting by halves. So is my parent function still one by one? It is still one by one. The parent function is always going to be one by one. But what's the dimension of my new box? Horizontally it's still one, but what is it vertically? It's one half, isn't it? Or 0.5. So what's my A value? One half. Is it a positive one half or a negative one half? Negative. Why? Because the end behavior is opposite. Right? So let's write it all together. G of X equals negative one half X cubed. Notice I didn't put parentheses. Because H is zero. Because H is zero. It doesn't need parentheses the minus four goes out at the end. Okay, so we mainly covered two different things. We covered graphing from scratch, from the equation, graphing, identifying domain and range, setting up your XY table, talking about end behavior, coming up with your inflection point, etc. And then we went over how do you write an equation <coughs> from the transformation that's given to you. Yes. Why A is negative. This one right here, again, if you're walking from left to right, you're walking uphill, right? This one, if you're walking from left to right, you're walking downhill, which means there is a vertical reflection. Right here? It's negative because the end behavior is opposite the parent function. Okay? All right, there you have it. Homework's coming around. It's worksheet 5.3. Happy studying.